The information age has forced humanity to engage in daily prolonged immersion within certain media of thought that over time become toxic media environments. Marshall McLuhan said, one thing about which fish know exactly nothing is water, since they have no anti-environment which would enable them to perceive the element they live in. We're all surrounded at every moment with information. This is our media environment, and our brain is constantly adapting itself to its media environment. Toxicity does not come from any specific medium or media content. It comes from prolonged immersion in one single medium, resulting in a state of mental imbalance. A healthy media environment is a happy medium an environment in which engagement is balanced across the mind's modalities in such a way that thought is expressed and received as freely as possible. With increasing frequency, our media draw us out of the physical state of existence within the real world and sequester us in its virtual simulacrum of reality, where we are blind to the toxicity of our invisible media environment because we are immersed within it. Media mindfulness provides perspective on the largely invisible media environments that envelop us, as well as a method for escaping them. The process is not about disengaging from media environments, but about understanding them and then balancing them so that they serve us rather than the other way around. If you change your media environment, your thoughts will naturally follow. The twin hemispheres of the brain each has its own way of understanding and engaging with its media environment. Ian McGilchrist calls them two different ways of attending to the world. The left hemisphere is adept at focusing deeply into matters, analyzing, deconstructing, while the right hemisphere takes a more holistic approach, looking at the big picture and recognizing overall patterns. The two ways of attending are complementary and, when balanced, provide us with the ability to get an intuitive, big-picture grasp of anything, while also having the option of thinking about something very specifically, logically, and systematically. In his book, The Master and His Emissary, Ian McGilchrist argues that the left hemispheric dominant type of human is relatively new to this world, a product of the intellectualization of Western society over the past few centuries. Before then, it was likely that most adult humans, in the Western world at least, had a more balanced style of cognitive engagement. His final thesis is that the modern world, the information age, has become an unfriendly environment for the brain because it disrupts the primordial balance between the hemispheres. In my previous book, Media Environments and Mental Disorder, I related this imbalance in hemispheric dominance to the mental imbalances that result in psychiatric disorders. The symptoms of autism, for instance, could be understood as the expression of a mind whose brain is dominated so much by the left hemisphere that necessary right hemispheric input is shut off to the point of dysfunction. The hemispheric imbalance model worked well for my book on mental disorders but disorders are examples of abnormal psychological subjects. When I tried applying a balancing model to a theoretically normal person, such as myself, I found it either too simple or too complex. Too simple because most of the things I do involve combinations of both left and right hemispheric functions, and too complex because the brain is so intertwined and interactive that it's very hard to tell what exactly is going on in any one part of the brain at any one moment. I needed an additional model to work with. Howard Gardner referred to his model of multiple intelligences as eight different ways of knowing the world. Each way is a discrete and mutually independent medium of mental engagement. When taken as a whole, Gardner's eight ways are equally distributed between the hemispheres. As a way of constructing my model of media mindfulness, 
I was comfortable moving beyond the primary model provided by McGilchrist, the two ways of attending, to the secondary operational model based on Gardner's theory, the eight ways of knowing. To understand how we can balance our media engagement, we have to understand what drives the media environments themselves. If our desire for media consumption is analogized as appetites, similar to those that we have for food, then some basic principles of media psychology become clear. The saturation principle is the most basic principle of media psychology to be aware of and the hardest principle to mindfully employ. Any physical material that absorbs another substance is prone to saturation. A sponge can absorb only so much water until it becomes saturated, at which point it cannot hold any more. Similarly, the human stomach can only absorb so much food. Once it reaches its saturation point, you feel completely full and you can't eat anymore. Although information is metaphysical, it does have certain physical properties that can lead to saturation, just like water or food. Time, as measured by duration, is a physical property measured on a clock. Quantity, in terms of the amount of information being processed, is also measurable, such as the number of pages read in a book. When we indulge our appetite and eat a large quantity in a short duration, we feel full or saturated, so we stop eating. However, sometimes we eat so much so fast, i.e. a binge, that we oversaturate ourselves, which is unhealthy and leads to obesity. Oversaturation is obviously not our goal, so why do we do it? We do it because we're indulging our appetite for food in such an unmindful way that, though it feels good in the moment, it's ultimately maladaptive and extremely self-destructive. Oftentimes we're feeling emotionally or interpersonally empty inside, so we use food to fill us up, even though food, as a physical object, can never satiate emotional or interpersonal needs. Media appetites and media saturation work in much the same way, but since media content is informational rather than physical, we either fail to recognize the symptoms of saturation or we fail to act on them, creating our own toxic media environments. Recognizing the feeling of saturation is the most important element of media mindfulness because the internal cue to abandon one mode of media engagement in favor of another is usually prompted by a feeling of saturation. Binging in this way is more about timing and impulsivity than it is about food. When we eat too quickly, we're setting ourselves up for a binge because we're not allowing for the feeling of saturation to be experienced. Media binges work the same way. When we binge watch a show, we're absorbing so much content so quickly and efficiently that we're not consciously aware of the feelings of saturation growing inside of us. Since media content is not a physical substance like food, it's not as simple to recognize the toxic feeling of media saturation. Nevertheless, being aware of the saturation principle by identifying the feelings of media saturation is really the first crucial step in the process of media mindfulness. The physical principle of displacement applies to media engagement as well because of the physical properties of media engagement. Time and attention devoted to one medium of engagement will displace time and attention that could be devoted to another. More time spent watching TV means less time reading. The principle is quite simple. If a toxic environment is one that's dominated by just one or two media of engagement, then we could say that overuse of those two media displaces the time and energy that could be devoted to the other media. Balancing therefore requires awareness of over-engagement in a certain medium and also an awareness of the need to reduce engagement in that one medium to increase engagement in other media. In my case, 
I found that I was spending the majority of my time and attention focusing on linguistic and logical mathematical media. To balance my toxic media environment, I deliberately displaced the time and attention I devoted to linguistic and logical mathematical media by deliberately increasing the time and attention I devoted to musical, visual spatial, interpersonal, naturalistic, intrapersonal, and bodily kinesthetic media of engagement. Remember, your brain knows what it needs more than your conscious mind does. You have to learn to trust your brain. Your brain will tell you when it's experiencing saturation. You just need to recognize the cues. Your unconscious mind will also intuitively crave the mode of media engagement that will relieve the imbalance. You just need to stop forcing yourself to perseverate in an unbalanced toxic media environment. Once you're aware of the feeling of saturation, moving on to a new mode of engagement in order to feel balance will feel as natural as going to sleep when you're tired, eating when you're hungry, or laughing when you're amused. The process is not so much about doing things, but about allowing yourself to stop doing the things that are causing imbalance. Once you recognize saturation and displacement in your media environment, you'll see the invisible bars of your mental prison cell. After that, it's a rather simple matter of just allowing yourself to get up and walk through the bars. Immersion in any one medium of engagement over time leads to a saturation point. The first response to media saturation is typically a feeling of mental nausea. It's similar to the nausea one feels when one eats too much, the feeling of being bloated, stuffed, overfull, along with the concurrent feeling of shame for binging in such a lazy and self-indulgent manner. Saturation nausea is a bad, gross, uncomfortable feeling rooted in shame and self-loathing. In his existential novel, La Nausée, Sartre reflected on the notion that the mind is constantly searching for meaning outside of itself, meaning to be found in books, movies, and other media. On occasion, the mind pauses in its feverish search because, perhaps, it sees that the media it's engaged in does not and will never purvey any actual meaning. It is at that moment, when our media fails us, that we realize that meaning will never be found in our media. This recognition that the thing that gives meaning to life, the search for meaning itself, is ultimately just a pointless and futile mind game pursued by a brain stuck in search mode, this is what makes us feel sick with ourselves. Like a dog chasing its own tail, we finally must admit not only defeat, but that the entire process is self-defeating. When we become saturated with the eternal search for self-understanding, we're left with nothing else to feel but disgust with the oversaturated subject itself, which is, of course, self-disgust. I exist, that is all, and I find it nauseating. Media is the thing we use to fill up the unbearable emptiness of our own being. When our media fails us, we're forced to observe ourselves and our existence as we truly are. And that is truly nauseating. Saturation nausea is the feeling of disgust with one's media environment, which is, of course, a feeling of disgust with oneself. The Swedish sickness, as Sartre dubbed it, is your cue to immediately bail on whatever media you're engaging in, in favor of another medium that makes you feel less sick with yourself. Recognizing and identifying that nauseous feeling inside your head is actually incredibly important because it's the cue that alerts you to the toxicity in your media environment. Consciousness does not have an off switch, but electronic media does. Utilize the simple but awesome power of off and you will become the master of your media rather than the other way around. If I'm watching a show or a movie and I start to feel saturation nausea, 
I immediately get up and I turn off the TV. Then I immediately let my intuition lead me to a different medium of engagement and the nausea immediately dissipates. Or simply change your media environment and your thoughts will follow. Media switching is the simplest way to counter saturation, but not the only way. Every form of media engagement has both a receptive and expressive mode of attending. This is true because all media are forms of communication. And communication involves either the reception of information, the expression of information, or both. So any medium that you engage in will have both a receptive and expressive mode. The inclination for us humans is to fall into the receptive mode of media engagement, which is generally passive, and to remain stuck in that position because it's so easy and requires little to no physical effort. Think about your modes of media engagement, the media you use to receive or transmit information. How much of your media engagement is receptive and how much is expressive? The next time you experience saturation nausea, you can consider one of two options. You can flip your mode of engagement from receptive to expressive, or you can switch your medium of engagement by moving on to an entirely different media environment. If you can't flip it, switch it. Oftentimes, saturation is experienced as a sense of fatigue rather than nausea even though there's no physical cause for exhaustion. Saturation fatigue is a feeling of exhaustion that arises out of a state of mental conflict with your media environment. It's not that you're exhausted. It's just that your brain has become so saturated with the specific medium it's engaged in that it literally cannot take it anymore. The more you force yourself to do it, the harder it becomes. Saturation fatigue it's very similar to Dale Carnegie's construct of pseudo-fatigue. Carnegie said that our fatigue is often caused not by work, but by worry, frustration, and resentment. Saturation fatigue doesn't arise from work itself, but from the massive effort we expend to force ourselves to continue working in a medium in which we're oversaturated. If we were to translate that idea into logical symbols, we would have F plus W equals E squared, where F equals force, W equals work, and E equals effort. Forcing yourself to work requires exponentially more effort than it does to just do the work by itself. In short, when you feel saturation fatigue, you know that you're fighting yourself. Guess who loses when you fight yourself? How can you tell when you're experiencing saturation fatigue as opposed to real fatigue? Turn off your computer or your phone, take a breath, walk outside into the fresh air, and engage your body and mind in some small physical task, like a walk. If the fatigue goes away in a minute or two, it was saturation fatigue. Want to be sure? Go back to your screen. If the feeling of fatigue immediately returns, you know why. The same phenomenon can be seen in others. Your child doesn't want to go to school, for instance. Tell him you're going out for ice cream instead, and he's flying out the door. He wasn't lying about being tired or feeling sick. He really felt it, but it was saturation, nausea, or fatigue, emanating from his saturation with the media environment of school. Saturation fatigue is hard to understand because it's so paradoxical. We feel fatigued while working, but energized the moment work is abandoned. When we're doing something fun, we feel energized, so that doing more of the same generates more energy to do even more, and fatigue doesn't even come into the picture. In contrast, when doing something we don't want to do anymore because of saturation, every second of work is agonizing and effortful because we're battling the counterforce of inhibition energy, 
the side of your brain that's arguing against the forces of saturation and actually inhibiting you from continuing engagement in that task. The energy you must expend to overcome your own inhibition is wasted energy. Stop forcing yourself. Stop fighting yourself. Stop ignoring the signals emanating from your own brain telling you to stop. What should you do instead? In general, we should all create a daily media environment or schedule that energizes and also maximizes mental resources at strategic times of the day and night. Be mindful of when your brain works best in relation to specific media and modes of engagement and follow the path that optimizes the functioning of your brain as opposed to the path set by a clock or a rigid externally imposed schedule. You'll find that if you get in touch with your intuitive sense of saturation, you'll immediately recognize the symptoms of saturation, nausea, and fatigue when they arise. And then instead of wasting energy fighting yourself, you'll switch media or flip modes into a form of engagement that will not only relieve your saturation symptoms, but will also energize you so that you'll be more active and more engaged than you could have possibly believed just moments before as you wallowed in your pit of self-imposed drudgery and boredom. That's lateral, paradoxical thinking for you. To avoid fatigue, expend more energy. In physics, the principle of least action dictates that the natural movement of a physical object will follow the course in which the least amount of action or energy is required. This is also known as the law of least effort or the path of least resistance. Humans adapt to their environments by intuitively figuring out how to get the most benefits out of the least amount of effort. We're naturally lazy because laziness conserves energy, and the conservation of energy is a natural adaptive response to one's environment. In our media engagement, we tend to overindulge in modes of engagement that require less energy passive receptive engagement, which naturally displaces modes that require more energy, active expressive engagement. It behooves us to be mindful of our natural tendency to lazily overindulge in receptive media engagement, such as binge watching TV. Sometimes we're binging because we're anxious or depressed and we can't think of something better to do. So we just keep binging, even though the awareness of our unhealthy binging behavior makes us feel anxious about our physical and mental health, and also makes us depressed about our own state of self-pitying sloth and self-indulgence. It becomes a vicious circle. Binging to soothe anxiety and depression actually causes more anxiety and depression, feelings that we soothe by engaging in even more binging. To add to the problem, Feelings of anxiety and depression drain our minds of mental energy, giving us the physical sense of being fatigued even though we've expended no physical energy while binging. It is this exact cycle that mode flipping can interrupt. When we deliberately flip from a receptive to an expressive mode of engagement, the energy being subdued in the receptive state of static inertia is released through bursts of creative expression. The irony of mental energy works both ways. When we're lethargic and bored, we overindulge in receptive media engagement, making us feel even more lethargic and more bored because our creative energy is trapped inside of us and it actually requires more energy to keep it trapped in, making us feel even more drained. We feel weak and powerless because we're fighting ourselves and we don't even know it. Only when we flip from a receptive to an expressive mode of engagement does the energy get released, thus stimulating the release of more energy, and then all of a sudden, you have all the energy in the world. Flipping your media engagement is a physical enactment of McLuhan's infamous adage, the medium is the message. Within that simple phrase is an entire philosophy. Whenever considering something, our attention is initially drawn to the figure standing out before us, the focal point of our attention. If the thing we're considering is a book, for instance, 
our focus is on the content of that media, the meaning of the words, the message. McLuhan's adage is a reminder to flip our attention from time to time, to perceive the effect of the ground of the medium we're engaged in. Consider for a moment the enormous psychological effect that book reading has on your cognitive tendency to think in words, your tendency to format your thoughts in the form of verbal propositions. Clearly, the effect of the medium of literacy itself is far more impactful on your mind and behavior than anything one person could ever write in a book. That mind flip is the essence of media mindfulness. I have bad thoughts, anxious thoughts about the future, depressing thoughts about my present and myself. In the past, I would have analyzed these thoughts to the point of frustration, in vain pursuit of some deeper meaning that I could untangle and construe, as if my own consciousness was a puzzle that only my consciousness could solve. I discussed these troubling thoughts with therapists and friends, family and well-wishers, but nothing was ever cured or resolved. And then, one day, I flipped my perception of myself. The medium was the message. The reason why I have anxious and depressed thoughts is because I'm an anxious and depressed person. I, myself, the medium of my own consciousness, am the generator of anxious depressive thoughts. Once perceived that way, I realized that the content of my actual thoughts were entirely inconsequential. My thoughts are anxious depressive because the medium for those thoughts, me, is anxious depressive. And it's as simple as that. Trying to cure the anxious depressed medium by analyzing the content of that medium is an exercise in futility. I had a similar revelation many years ago, but I forgot it, or at least never applied it to myself. In my 20s, I worked as a creative arts therapist and counselor at a mental hospital in New York City, where most of my patients were schizophrenic. Therapy with schizophrenics is a challenge because they often have very elaborate delusions that monopolize their thoughts and fantasies. I was trying to figure out the meaning or root behind my patients' delusions as an attempt to help them. I consulted with the floor psychiatrist for guidance. The psychiatrist said, in so many words, that delusions were nonsense, the figments of unhinged minds, and that I was wasting my time trying to figure them out. My job, when counseling patients, was to make sure that they were compliant with their medication regimes and that their other psychosocial needs were being met so that they can remain stable and not become a danger to themselves or others. At the time, I was a bit disenchanted with the psychiatrist's unromantic view of my psychotic patient's delusions, but after a good deal of time listening to them, I have to admit that she was right. A schizophrenic brain is a medium for delusions, so a schizophrenic has delusions because he is schizophrenic, and that's that. The medium is the message. Analyzing the message, studying the delusions, may be interesting, but it will have absolutely no effect on the actual medium itself, the schizophrenic's brain. Applying this insight to myself, I realized that if I didn't want to be stifled by my own anxious, depressive thoughts, I needed to adjust the medium by changing my environment, rather than wasting my time focusing on the content of the medium, which were my thoughts. If I change my environment, my behaviors automatically change to adapt to that environment, and in turn, my thoughts change to reflect my new behaviors. In short, change your media environment and your thoughts will follow.